Welcome to Roots Tech Connect 2021. My name is Brandis Goodman and I'll be speaking about connecting generations through celebrations. Each one of us has our own why behind our desire to study family history and genealogy. I grew up surrounded by photo albums, binders full of pedigree charts and family group sheets, and written histories, and I always enjoyed looking through those things. They were a product of years of hard work by other family members, and they were and are wonderful resources. But they didn't ignite that fire in me to discover more on my own. I was one of those people who felt like all the work had been done for my family already. Elder M. Russell Ballard said, we can draw strength to face the challenges of today from the exemplary faith and courage of those who faced and conquered the challenges of yesterday. When I first read this quote, I loved it. I thought it was great. But then I realized, how can I draw strength from my ancestors if I don't know who they are? I had to find my own motivation to study family history so that I could learn what challenges my ancestors had conquered. For me, this why came during a time in my life when I was facing difficult and traumatic circumstances that were beyond my control. In the quiet pre-dawn hours of the morning, when anxiety would wake me up and I couldn't seem to turn my mind off, reading about my ancestors was a positive and welcome distraction. The more I read, the more I understood what Elder, Elder Ballard meant. I began to truly feel the power that lies in studying family history, and I wanted my family to have that experience as well. But how do you describe a feeling in a way that evokes that same desire in someone else? As a busy mother of five children, I struggled with how to help them become interested in learning about their ancestors. The solution, though fairly simple, has far exceeded what I hoped the result would be. We started celebrating some of the milestones in the lives of our ancestors. We honor them in simple celebrations where we incorporate traditional foods or family recipes, regional and local history, personal narratives, and photos. When we started this, I had no idea how much our family would enjoy it, how much it would expand our palates, or how much my children would become attached to the family members they were introduced to. It's become one of our favorite family traditions. The first ancestor birthday we celebrated was my third great grandmother, Jane McDonald Clyde. We planned our menu based on what we knew about her. She was born in Northern Ireland in 1827 in a small village near the coast. So we had fish as our main dish. Her father managed a farm where he grew vegetables and fruits. So we made a dish called coal cannon, which consists of cabbage sauteed in bacon grease and then mixed with mashed potatoes and crumbled bacon. We rounded out the meal with Irish soda bread cooked in a skillet and served with Irish butter and homemade jam, both of which were things that Jane made herself, some to feed to her family and some to sell. While we ate our meal, I read Jane's life story from her family search profile and shared photos of Jane, her family, and their home in Heber City, Utah. Jane was quite the character and the kids especially liked hearing about her hidden stash of gold coins that was found almost 60 years after she died in the basement of the home as it was being demolished. Even though I had thrown the whole thing together fairly last minute, it went really well and it inspired us to continue doing more. Since then, our ancestor birthday celebrations have followed a simple and easily reproducible format. First, we created a calendar of events to celebrate. The simplest way to do this is by using the Family Search Calendar of Ancestor Moments tool. This tool will give you a calendar of known birth dates, death dates, and wedding anniversaries back to your third great grandparents. We combined the calendars from my family and my husband's family, and then added in a few other family members like my grandmother's aunt and uncle who have no descendants. If the Family Search Calendar tool is not an option for you or doesn't give you what you're looking for, you can create a calendar using whatever sources you have available to you. Choose one or two ancestors per month to learn about and celebrate. Plan a meal, snack, treat, or activity that relates to the ancestor. It could be a family recipe like my great-grandmother's sour cream cookies that all her grandchildren still talk about. Or it could be a dish that was traditional in your family, like the tamales my husband's family used to make every fall. It doesn't even have to be homemade. 
I asked my grandma for meal suggestions when we were planning a celebration for my great grandfather's birthday. She told me that my great grandma would have cooked up some fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and an apple pie for him on his birthday. Well, it just so happens that I really stink at making fried chicken, but you know who doesn't? Colonel Sanders. So we had KFC fried chicken with homemade mashed potatoes and gravy. It was delicious and it accomplished the goal of making an association between the person we were honoring and a food that he would have enjoyed. If you don't have family recipes, you could opt for a dish that's traditional in the region your ancestor came from. When we celebrated the birthday of my third great grandfather, Owen Wright, we didn't have any family recipes, but we knew he was born in Wisconsin, that he was a homesteader in Nebraska, and that he raised his own livestock and food crops. With that information, we planned a meal of steak and gravy, roasted veggies, biscuits, and some Wisconsin cheese that I found at the grocery store. While we eat our celebratory meal, we share photos, memorabilia, and stories about the ancestor. If your ancestors' descendants have added memories to their profiles on FamilySearch, then the simplest way to do this is by reading what's available. On one side of my family, there have been volumes and volumes of records and written histories kept for generations. Books have been published. It's very easy to share life histories with my family from that branch of our tree. But that's not the case for the other side of my family. When I first started this, there was very little written about the majority of my mom's side of the family. I had to figure out ways to piece together something written that I could share. When I construct a written history, I start with what I know. Name, birth date, birthplace, death date, death place, anything that I already know, including how I'm related to the person. The next step is always to talk with other relatives who may have known the person or might know more about them than you do. One of my kids recently had a school assignment to create a slideshow about an ancestor, and she chose my grandma who died when I was in high school. We came up with a list of questions that we thought would paint a picture of who grandma was and what she was like. And then my daughter called my siblings, my mom, and my aunts. She asked each person the same set of questions, and we listened as each one recalled slightly different details about grandma's life and told us stories they hadn't thought about in years. There were some questions that everyone gave the same answers to, to the point that it became comical. Other questions gave insights into different time periods in grandma's life. The finished product was a personal history with much greater depth than what I could have come up with on my own. Another important tool in constructing written history is the databases of public records that are available digitally. The couple in this photo are my third great grandparents, August and Christine Skaggerland. When we first celebrated August's birthday, I knew virtually nothing about him and had never seen a photo of him. It turned out that I even had his name wrong because of an incorrectly indexed census record in FamilySearch. When I constructed his profile, I started with just the details readily available in his family search profile. I looked at the scanned image of each source attached to his profile, and from those records, I was able to learn that he had come to the United States from Sweden in April 1883 and lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. I could see in the census records that he worked in a barbed wire factory. That led me to do a little digging into the history of Worcester, and I ended up narrowing down the name of the factory where he worked because of the two factories in town, it was the only one that was producing barbed wire during that time frame. With each new de detail that I uncovered, I got a little more excited and a little more motivated to keep digging. At one point, I decided to just search his name in an internet search engine. One of the results was a family website created by a distant relative, which included this photo. The moment I saw it, I knew from the fluffy white hair and the mustache that he was my relative. His grandson, my great-grandfather, had that same fluffy white hair and mustache in his elder years. The website confirmed some of the discoveries that I had made and provided many details about the family that I wouldn't have otherwise had, including a scanned copy of August's citizenship certificate. Later on, I was given digital copies of old family photos from my grandfather's collection, like this one, and was able to confirm without a doubt 
that the couple from the photo I had found online really was August and Christine Skaggerlin. Websites like Google Earth and real estate websites can be fun as well. In the 1900 census, there was an address listed for my third great grandmother and her two sons. I looked up the address on Google Earth and was able to find a street view with a photo of the house. Then I used a real estate website to find details about the house that was at that location and confirmed that the house on Google Earth was the same house that my family had lived in at the time of the 1900 census. Other records databases such as newspapers.com can be sources of anecdotal information about the lives of ancestors. Many of my ancestors lived in small towns where events like a child being sick or out of town family members coming to visit were newsworthy. Last year, newspapers.com had a free weekend. And during that weekend, I was able to find dozens of articles about family members dating as far back as the late 1800s. Once I find everything I can from the sources available, I compile it all into a narrative form that can be read during our ancestor birthday dinner. So why food? Why is food such an important component of celebrating ancestor birthdays? I attended a conference a couple of years ago where the keynote speaker, Evan Kleiman, a chef and radio show host, made a statement that really resonated with me. She said, I wish children could become more engaged with food on a level that is more intellectual. There is so much satisfaction and curiosity about food that has nothing to do with eating it. Her words made so much sense. There is so much more to food than just eating it. When we make food part of an ancestor's story, we create a multi-sensory connection between our children and their ancestors. In the future, when they smell the scent of that food cooking, or they handle that dough, or they chop those vegetables, it will remind them of the story they heard when they had that dish the first time, which will in turn remind them of the experience they shared with their family. Food helps to create stronger associations than reading or hearing stories alone. One of my goals with family history has been to contribute to our family history library in a meaningful way like my grandma has always done. For years, her Christmas gift to all her grandchildren and children was a new volume of family history she had compiled over the previous year. I just didn't know what that contribution would look like for me, but this has become that contribution. Each time we celebrate another ancestor birthday, I can add one more person's profile, recipes, photos, and supporting sources to our book. This is a great one bite at a time approach to writing family history. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Mine certainly is not. It's as simple as printing out the life histories, recipes, and photos for each person we celebrate and putting them into a three ring binder arranged by birth month. You may also want to share what you compile in a digital format and use cloud-based file sharing to share it with extended family. Another option would be to have the information bound into a book. There are lots of options, so choose whatever works best for you. Each year you can add to your book by celebrating different ancestors than you did in years prior. If you choose one to two ancestors a month, after a couple of years, you will have written profiles for 40 or 50 of your ancestors. And that is a meaningful contribution to your family's history. It's been about two and a half years since my family started celebrating our ancestors. This simple practice has blessed our family in so many different ways. It's expanded our food horizons. We've made polenta and gnocchi from Northern Italy, Jersey wonders and black butter from the Isle of Jersey, tamales from Mexico, meatballs and potato pancakes with lingonberry jam from Sweden, dozens of regional recipes from around the U.S., and we've tried family recipes we had never tried before. We've discovered that we have a taste for foods that we may not have tried otherwise and have put many of them into our everyday meal rotation. We've learned about the places our ancestors came from, and we've mapped out trips we'd like to take to visit their homelands. We've read stories about the tragic events in their lives that completely turned their worlds upside down. And this has given us a platform for open family dialogue on very difficult and sensitive topics within the context of our own family tree. Our children know who these people are now, 
and they bring them up in conversations. They'll talk about the meals we had for their ancestors' birthdays, and they get excited about planning the next celebration. They like to hear stories about their ancestors. Some nights when we sit down to dinner, our six-year-old will ask me, so mommy, what ancestor are we talking about tonight? They're interested in family history now, and that's exactly what I hoped would happen when we started these simple celebrations. My hope for my family and what my experience has been is that somehow knowing that these imperfect people made it through the things they made it through will empower them to face their own challenges in life and not only to survive those things, but to find joy in the midst of them and know that there will be life on the other side of their struggles. Honoring the lives of those who came before us has a way of reconnecting us with pieces of ourselves that we did not know existed. Whatever it is that you've come to Roots Tech in search of, I hope that you find it. Thank you for watching and be sure to check out more of the wonderful presentations at Roots Tech Connect 2021.